Hello, everyone. My name is Young Lee, and I'm the president and CEO of the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation, as well as a proud former Damon Runyon Fellow. Damon Runyon's mission is simple, funding brave and bold. We provide funding to the most brilliant young scientists to enable them to pursue high-risk, high-reward research that le leads to breakthroughs in the understanding and treatment of all cancers. We have a long track record of success. Over the past 75 years, we have invested over $430 million in nearly 4,000 scientists. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation Catalyst webinar series featuring Damon Runyon scientists. Today, we'll be talking about breakthroughs for all, advancing equity in cancer research through inclusive design and technology. This webinar will center around healthcare disparities, how research works to minimize them, and how technology is an effective tool to bridge the gap. I'm delighted to turn the program over now to our moderator, Dr. Ami Bhatt, Associate Professor, Professor of Medicine and Genetics at Stanford University. Ami was a Damon Runyon clinical investigator. Her lab seeks to improve outcomes in patients with blood cancers by characterizing the dynamics and effects of the microbiome, which is comprised of the bacteria, viruses, and fungi that live naturally within and on us. She focuses on how changes in the microbiome are associated with serious complications in immunocompromised patients, such as those undergoing cancer treatments, such as chemotherapy and stem cell transplants. She's also co-founder of the nonprofit organization Global Oncology, whose mission is to bring the best cancer care to underserved patients around the world. She will introduce our distinguished panelists. After each panelist presents, we will have a Q&A session moderated by Dr. Butt. Please type your questions in the Q&A box in the chat, and we will ask as many questions as time allows. This webinar will conclude no later than 7 p.m. Eastern or 4 p.m. Pacific. Ami? Thank you very much, Young. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be here. I'm so appreciative that you all are putting on this very important presentation and webinar. And I'm very, very honored to have the opportunity to moderate this excellent, excellent series today. Um, we're going to be hearing from three very distinguished investigators. Uh, we'll be hearing from Heather Yeo. Uh, Heather is an Associate Professor of Population Health Sciences and Surgery at Weill Cornell Medicine. We'll hear from Professor Lee Lee, who is the Walter M. Seward Professor of Family Medicine. He is also the co-leader of Cancer Prevention and Population Health at the UVA Comprehensive Cancer Center. And last but not least, we'll hear from Professor Ellie Van, Van Allen. Ellie is an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. He's also the chief of population sciences at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. So we'll go ahead and kick things off with Professor Yeo. Thanks so much for the introduction, Ami. I'm gonna double check that you see my full screen. We do. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I'm going to kick this off a little bit by talking about how to understand racial disparities and really think about how to be more inclusive. Um, I'm going to start this off with a little bit of a contextual context. Um, many res all researchers uh, are now required to undergo training so that we understand some of the disparities in healthcare. And a lot of it started um, back in the 1930s. Uh, in a study known as the uh, Tuskegee Study of Untreated Syphilis in the Negro Male. In 1932, the United States Public Health Service, um, as, along with the Tuskegee Institute, conducted a study of uh, individuals who may or may not have had syphilis um, and told these individuals without consent uh, that they were going to be treating them for a blood disorder. They didn't tell them what they were treating them for and they wanted to observe the natural history of their disease. Most of these men uh, were uh, known to have syphilis at the time um, and were monitored for decades actually um, without getting any treatment for their syphilis. Uh, this was particularly egregious as a treatment for syphilis, uh, penicillin as we know it, was discovered in the 1940s. And again, these individuals were not treated 
uh, and not even told of their diagnoses. Uh, what they got instead was uh, some lunch snacks um, and uh, some medical exams uh, and it, free insurance uh, for burial, actually. It took really until 1972 uh, when an article was published that described the study uh, for the study to come to light and for kind of politics to swirl around it and for us to realize uh, what an egregious um, treatment of these individuals had happened during the study. Um, and then it wasn't until 1997 when the government actually finally issued a formal apology. Well, the Tuskegee studies were obviously clearly very egregious and set up a lot of distrust among the African-American community. There are many, many more subtle biases um, and a lot of distrust from the Black community. However, these uh, disparities exist across many other uh, racial and ethnic groups, across individuals of different socioeconomic status, individuals with dis disabilities, immigrants, uh, and those of underrepresented minorities um, who may be of the LGBTQ uh, community or uh, even individuals who are unprotected or uninformed like younger adults and adolescents. And so these disparities uh, exist in many different ways. And it's important for us to think about those. In cancer in particular, um, we see disparities across all different cancer groups. Uh, while we know that, for example, uh, African-American men have 111% higher risk of dying from prostate cancer and African-American women have a 39% risk of dying from breast cancer. These disparities are also seen in Hispanic population, Asian populations, American Indian populations. And so these disparities are important for us to understand as we're doing research. They create a number of challenges as they create, there are differences in risk factors for certain cancers. Some of those are hereditary and genetic. Some of those are related to social determinants of health. There are disparities for all the way from screening to treatment. And what we're really concerned about here today are the disparities around research. Now it's important to understand that these underlying problems affect things at all levels. Different communities are exposed to different environmental factors. There are different behavioral factors that also play a role in communities, social factors, clinical factors, and psychologic factors and as mentioned, some genetic factors. It's important, however, as researchers that we actively involve minority populations in our research and understanding our research, and that we think about community-based solutions, screening techniques, and that we look towards research to understand disparities. Now, we're talking a little bit today about how useful technology is. When I started as a Damon Runyon scholar now, many years ago, um, I thought that technology had the potential to decrease a lot of disparities in healthcare. And the reason that I thought of this is because increasingly adults have access to mobile phones and many of them are using the internet daily. And my patient population, which is often older adults with colon cancer, I understood from research that we've done that older adults are more likely to actually use technology regularly if they're taught. So I said about uh, now in 20, well, where are we? I think it was uh, 2015, I uh, started applying for the Damon Runyon Foundation grant and was able, uh, fortunate to be funded by the Runyon Foundation. We actually developed an app to monitor patients after surgery. We wanted to monitor them to help increase recovery and really access to care. So they would be able to um, communicate with their physicians. But early on, I made mistakes. Um, so the very first thing I did was I created an iPhone app, um, thinking that I was being, you know, using the best technology and this would be a good thing to do. But I quickly found out that many disadvantaged populations don't have access to iPhones. They actually may have Androids um, because many of the Android phones are less expensive and are more useful to older adults on a fixed income. So as I carried through my study, there was a lot of considerations that I started taking into consideration along some of these disparities. 
as I mentioned, just the cost of the phone alone. Uh, there's also questions about Wi-Fi connectivity, whether or not someone would be able to afford Wi-Fi, whether or not they would even be able to have access to care to come for follow-up visits. I also was concerned because I was offering individuals a free Fitbit, whether or not this would be considered economic manipulation for uh, financially disadvantaged individuals. And as I was developing my app, I realized that education level was important. It had to be simple and easy, even for the lowest education levels. But I was hopeful as I created the new technology, things would be streamlined and able to reach more people. So we made a lot of changes through the app over the course of the study. We're now uh, over two thirds the way through our randomized trial, looking at our app to help increase patient monitoring and decrease readmissions. And one of the things that we've done is really try and focus on an app that is accessible for all education levels, that is uh, accessible for all uh, racial, gender, and ethnic groups. Uh, we actually worked with a, a medical illustrator to create um, different images because I realized one day that I'd use stock images and most of the stock images of older adults are of white adults. Um, so we made a lot of changes to our app. Um, we're in the middle of the trial and we, I think, have done a pretty good job of trying to be inclusive of different races, different ages, uh, and different genders. Um, and I'm really thankful for uh, the uh, Damon Runyon Foundation for supporting our research. So I think that my colleagues today are going to share some uh, really exciting other research. Um, I just think it's really important that as we discuss uh, technology, as we discuss disparities, uh, there's so much potential, but it's really important for us to think about those things as we're working on our research. Um, so thanks. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Dr. Bat. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Yo. That was fantastic. Our next presentation is going to be from Professor Lee Lee. All right, can you guys see my slides now? Yes, we can. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I started my career as a family physician about 22 years ago. Uh, yes, actually, I was fortunate to be the second cohort as a Damien clinic investigator. And um, so I share with some of my career paths and how it gets to the point to focus on my research on colon cancer risk disparity. So I also disclaimer, I'm a member of the US Preventive Service Task Force and uh, my team will provide in this presentation reflect my own my individual views and do not represent the views or rec recommendation of the U.S. Provincial Service Task Force, except we're noted on the individual slides. So, uh, Doc, had the U.S. just mentioned about colon cancer, I actually my research in the space of colon cancer risk risk assessment, prevention, and uh, disparities. So, uh, even though colon cancer is one of the cancers that we know is preventable, and the uh, Incidence and mortality even has been decreasing in the last decades, uh, only to increase uh, um, uh, screening and a better, better, you know, better diagnosis and and the treatment. But the diff the disparity between blacks and white are actually widening. So the the African Americans still have the high incidence and the mortality compared to okay, the whites. And the African tends to be diagnosed with colon cancer at a younger age, and relatively have more right side lesions than the left side lesion. Actually, the right side lesion colon cancer is more aggressive than the left side colon cancer. So under this big picture, I started my career about 22 years ago, really trying to focus on understand the risk factors. And then we, I was lucky to find it by the Ryan Clinical Invest Award. And then from there, we assembled a cohort. We call this. Cleveland colon uh, screening and risk factor studies. Basically, we recruited about 3,000 people from the Cleveland areas. And uh, if people, uh, folks know that Cleveland and the Cleveland downtown in Cuyahoga County are uh, largely uh, African population and in the suburbs uh, is largely actually a uh, uh, white population. So we will, the University Hospital of Kids Western Reserve, that's my, my, I must start my career there. 
and really sit in the middle of the city. So we were able to recruit about 3,000 people uh, who come to University Hospital for screening colonoscopy, and 40% of this cohort are self-reported as African-American. That's allowed us to really start to look at racial disparity, really a program focused on etiology, risk factors, risk assessment, and biology, we do a lot of genomics, microbiomes, as well prevention, early detection, and the chemo prevention as part of the GR sport program at Case West, as well as my own research. So one thing we have looked at, actually, people hear, probably hear about that in terms of disparity, where you lose matters. Uh, 2016, the uh, Love, with, Love with Johnson Foundation has basically published a map nationwide and showing that people live, live in different neighborhoods has very different uh, experience in terms of mortality and health. So my, my previous institution in Cleveland, the two communities only about seven miles apart, their life expectancy is about 18 years apart. So you live in one community and then you are seven miles away from the other community, it's about 18 years in terms of life expectancy. So we really try to understand beyond the risk factors we're talking about individual smoking, obesity, physical activity, what are the impact of social environment, how the impact of our biology drive the uh, cancer disparity. So one of the projects we took on is that to understand how the neighborhood disadvantage index, which is basic based on the neighborhood characteristics, based on 17 factors um, assessed from the American Community Survey, it's based on risk, uh, it's a fact analysis. You, you use 17 parameters, each have different loadings and add them up and then get a score. The higher the score, the more disadvantaged in a community people live. So what we have done is actually really a summary slide showing this. So we're trying to act develop a risk prediction model of, of a NOMA in our cohort study. As I said, the cohort we developed has 14% effort, give us a good sample size to really look at racial difference in terms of risk prediction modeling. So here's, not, uh, here's, here's basic summary slides. If you look at these slides, so look at X axis observed risk and the Y axis predict risk. In a perfect setting, you will have diagonal that's a perfect pre prediction model. So this, this uh, result shown that if we actually develop a, we did actually develop a risk prediction model of colon neoplasia without considering NDI, it turns out when you when do a regression model, NDI is an independent risk factor beyond the individual risk factor. So I'm talking about the BMI, smoking, family history, age, those. So if you look at the uh, blue lines, that's the one, the prediction model without NDI, without neighborhood disband index. So from the S, X, X, from the left to right side, basically people on the right side has high D, NDI, meaning they're a little more disadvantaged of, uh, uh, communities. So you look at the uh, prediction model, basically, without cancer NDI, it tends to overestimate the risk of colon neoplasia for those who live in the affluent community. That's on the far left side, but tends to underestimate the risk of colon neoplasia for those people live in the disadvantaged community. That's on the far right side, the blue lines. And we add in the NDI to the models. That's a that's a red line. Looks more like a, a more getting close to diagonal. That's more reflecting the uh, perfect prediction. So you can see the C statistic about 7% compared to 65%. This is really interesting uh, results. And the interpretation of this is, if you think about the nationwide, they have a limited resource. We allocate resource. Of course, the policymaker will allocate more resource to those who are at high risk areas. I'm sorry, actually, the, the ambulance is just passed by in my office. So of course, this will, will aggregate more of disparity and people live in a disadvantaged uh, community who get less of, of, of uh, resource for screening. So that's the takeaway from this study. Um, so my research in the last 10 years has been really trying to understand how the environment will impact uh, our genome, epigenome and the microbiome to drive the racial disparity uh, in colorectal cancer and early neoplasia. So one thing is we focus on biological aging. So you can think, think about biologic aging, some biomarkers, you can add into the risk prediction power of birth age. So if you look at this graph, as we get older, because of heterogeneity of the environment exposure, as well as our back, genetic background, the prediction of risk or disease, the added value of biologic aging and on top of birth age 
it started to divert. divert. So if you look at this graph x, x, x here, so if you, you can think about it, the one person here, three person here can have same birth age, but their biological age looks different. Where right? some looks older than uh, older than their uh, real age, some looks younger. We call this age acceleration and age deceleration. So as I said, the, the positive predictive value of, of the biological age to our health decreases as we're getting older because of heterogeneity. So that's the phenomenon we call, we're trying to leverage this uh, to predict the uh, disease risk. So one of the projects we'd like to be funded by an NCI, the P20, it's, uh, it's a planning grant for disparity cancer, disparity spore. I got funded by as, as a PI, then I moved from Case West to, uh, to UVA and the NCI will allow us to, allow them to stay as MPI and be, basically become a collaboration between Case West and UVA uh, as a, a collaboration. So the project I work on was built on the cohort I share with you, about 3,000 people from Cleveland. And with, within that co cohort, we actually collected both tissues, um, fresh tissues from about 140 patients who gave us 16 biopsy all the way from rectum to the cecum. And we basically had matched normal tissue from individual on the right side, left side column. So here's the hypothesis of my project. So basically we look at whether the individual lifestyle as well as neighborhood disadvantage, disadvantage index impact and race impact age acceleration or deceleration. And this translates into differential risk of uh, coronary neoplasia. So the idea is that as as I said, the, uh, the basically look at this line, that's basically we use some biological age biomarkers put, uh, and this line is a perfect prediction, but you have people above the line in the red zone, that's called age acceleration and below the line, blue lines is age deceleration or looks younger. So uh, one of the projects we were really actually trying to understand if you, if you remember the second slide, so the left and the right side colon are two different disease entity, which we're really trying to understand and uh, where the left and the right side colon has a very different molecular profiles and which may drive the research that we, we have observed because as I said, African tends to have more right side lesion compared to, to white uh, people. So here's the design. So we, uh, we fortunately have about 140 patients that give us um, biopsy from both left and right side. Basically we have individual matched colon tissues from those folks. And we allow us to look at within individual difference between left right side colon, ascending and descending colon, as well as across race, a group difference. And the results are quite interesting. So here's, here's data. So we look at uh, epigenetic age acceleration. We use uh, Steve Horvath who have developed this epigenetic clock and uh, which has been applied to many different tissues and colon, colon tissue is one of them actually works really well. So our data shown that actually if you apply Horvath epsilon clock to the tissue, the prediction of the age is much better for, for European Americans, self-report as European American based wise at R is about 0.85, but for African Americans but it's lower, it's 0.66. In yeah, any way, but it's still within the reported range of the correlation between chronological age and DNA age. So you take the difference, as I said, you take difference residue, you use that as prediction for disease risk. That's been, that's people doing. And what we have shown here is quite a, quite a, a striking result. If you look at the right sub panel, that we see right and left side difference in terms of African aging. For African Americans, the right side corner is about 1.5 years older than their own left side colon. But for European Americans, it's the opposite. The left side colon is about 1.9 older than the right side colon. And we actually validated this, this uh, result in three globally uh, public, uh, public, public data validated that the, yes, actually the left side colon of uh, European Americans indeed are uh, older than the right side colon, but we don't have any other data to validate what we observe in African American, but in, in our study, we have 88 African American in our study and 40 in European American. We think the sample size in our study is big enough to really give a very robust quantity. So based on this now, we also just look at the rectum as well, given my data, my, my side has rec rectum data. Indeed, it shows the same thing. Rectum, the age acceleration is about the same, it looks the same as the left side colon. So basically, the rectum of African American, the age acceleration, uh, 
the African American at a young age than the uh, than the uh, white person, including our study. So we actually uh, followed this list now doing some study, uh, uh, trying to understand some of the uh, environmental factors, how that impact this. All right, so we, we look at that and also here you look at this graph, this, uh, let me explain what it is. So basically we look at absent aging, we also look at the whole epigenome dehydrogenation, look at dehydrogenation position as well as regions. So looks like the, in African the right cycle is enriched, really enriched with hypermethylate differential method positions in the right side column. Basically, this is a T-summer T-test, and the pink is showing that there's no differential, differential methylation, but then on the left side of each, par, uh, each panel is hypermethylation. If you look at the right side colon, almost 70% of the right side colon of AA Americans is hypermethylated, but there's only over 48% of the left side colon. In a sense, there's a really ratio difference and a side difference in terms of dehydrogenation. And also, we have done some work now as an organoid to develop from the patient and look at the gene, gene expression. And that fits nice to this picture as well. So now I mentioned that we are, I'm a population scientist and uh, my work is really at interface of molecular population to simply put. So uh, recently I have uh, recruited one uh, senior scientist to my lab now, actually he has tremendous uh, experience working with organoids. We have developed, we're developing a lot, uh, almost 200 organoids, patient developed organoids, allow us to use organoids as a model to look at one thing is a gene uh, environment exposure. In a sense, we use organoids derived from the patient as a model to expose them to different environment exposure and assess downstream the gene expression as well as methylation changes. So here's two examples we just published recently. So the value of the organoids, we take actually normal tissue from FFP, that's familiar uh, uh, FFP, basically APC, gene mutation and by age 39, most of them will develop colon cancer because of the APC mutation, general mutation. So we take X bobs from the FAP patient, normal appearing tissue, as well as control who has no FAP. And we looks like give some lot of hint. We just pop this. So I mentioned that actually age. Actually, in colon cancer, there's a really alarming actually phenomenon called uh, early onset CRC or the left shift of age onset. It's the predictions that in about five, 10 years, we will see about 10% of the general population, the newly diagnosed colon cancer will be among those who are younger than 50. So we talk about colon cancer, of course, actually uh, 20 years or 30 years, we're talking about it's the older disease, older people disease, even now the average, average age diagnosed 64, but now we are seeing now sporadic colon cancer now in people younger than 50, in the 40, 30, even 20. Those are people not the genomic syndrome. It's really as sporadic colon, colon cancer. It's alarming. Of course, there's a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons speculated why so. But that being said, there, there is really no model to interrogate the early onset CRC and how that links to our genomes, epigenome, microbiome, as well as environmental exposure. So we think that the FAP uh, um, organoids give us a really exact, really good model to us for us to interrogate some of the gene and the genetic pathways you show in FFP then will contextualize with colon cancer as well normal tissue, give us some insight into some of the paths with the genes we can, we can uh, detect from, from early on as a risk prediction model, risk assessment. So basically what we have seen that the difference of the FFP patient without existing cancers are directly enriched for CRC tumor event. So basically we have our own organoids work and we contextualize with the uh, with the uh, uh, TCGA code data as well as color show, looks like there's some, some overlap of the genes of paths we identified in the normal tissue of FP patient organoids with the colon cancer tumor and the compared to adjacent normal tissue. And also we think this is potentially a model we can use for, for interrogate early stage of uh, uh, early onset colorectal cancer as a model. So we have done actually a, a few works uh, in this space and we are launching a few studies now. One is a met, met, uh, metformin, which has been taught as a potential cancer provision agent as well as sugar soon beverage intake, high fructose corn syrup to expose organoids to this, to this uh, exposure to see what's a change in the, uh, in the downstream gene pathways and as well as methylation. 
So I said, I'm a family doc. And uh, so I don't deal with cancer patients on a daily basis, but I do actually uh, uh, work with, with general population in terms of preventing care. So uh, he's shown that task force is committed to actually uh, to reduce um, health disparity through uh, the entire methodology and the process of the task force uh, uh, recommendation. So the task force is based 16 uh, experts in primary care, behavioral science, and uh, preventive care so that we review all the evidence for different topics and uh, we follow very transparent uh, uh, methodology. Anyone can nominate any any uh, topics we want to discuss, and this will post at the ARC website. Then we have a group doing uh, topic product prioritization, and this will post again and get public public uh, uh, comments. And then we come up with then a research plan followed by evidence review. Then all this will post to public uh, comments. So last year, the task force has come work together and come with this kind of position paper how the task force will. It will, it will, it will uh, de develop the methods we use to mitigate systemic racism in clinical uh, prevention services. Really, actually, the six actions to address the racism in clinical preventive uh, service recommendations. One, we consider race as a social contrast, not a biological factor. That's number one. Second, we increase the uh, di increase diversity of the members sit on the task force. And as I said, one key thing is the, uh, the methodology. Uh, in terms of how we assess the evidence and what kind of methodology, of course, the randomized trials are always dominant in terms of our, our, our revealed evidence, but now we're trying to really be more, more conscious about how the methodology can be utilized to help, help to address the disparities. And then dissemination is one big issue. A lot of clinical uh, service de delivery is not because there's no recommendations, it's really hard the uptake and how it's been delivered in the real world, and it really involves health systems. And uh, then uh, we also identify the gaps in terms of uh, evidence gap where we should you know, advise the federal and uh, and the foundation in terms of in terms of uh, uh, investment in, in research. So I want to give you an example about the lung cancer screening. This was published uh, about two years ago now. So the two thousand. In 2000, uh, 2013, the task force has a, has a recommendation, the B recommendation is basically, uh, it has, so A and B would be basically recommended to do it, and C will be shared decision, and D will not do it. I basically was, okay, there's no, not sufficient data or evidence support as whether or not recommend. So this is a B recommendation. So the 2013 recommendation is called, if you can remember, the A, 55, 80, 30, 15. So it's basically the recommendation was for people who smoke, smoker, age 50 to 80, smoke more than 30 packs a year, or those who quit smoking, but 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 it, not in the past 15 years. So that they stop smoking within the last 15 years. So those are the criteria for, for screening. So now the national lung screening test, uh, trial basically and also the, the European trial showing that the low dose CT scan can save lives, it reduce the mortality by 20%. So, so that's a recommendation of, uh, and C C CMS has uh, adapted this as part of the uh, approving care. So the task force look at this about three years ago, revisit the evidence, and the, now the new recommendation will be 50, 80, 20, 15, basic recommendation to Every year, do a load of screening by CT for those aged 50 to 80 years smoke, smoker who has smoked um, 20 packs a year, pack years for those who quit smoke and quit smoke within the uh, uh, last 15 years. So this actually- uh, Professor Lee, sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but I think we're gonna have to wrap up yeah. soon to give I'm Professor Van on some time. Okay. So I think the, I wanna say that this new recommendation based benefit, disproportionate benefit, uh, People of color, especially black, male and female, and uh, Latinos, and the increase the increase eligibility for CT scan. So I think this is the one example showing that how we're trying to mitigate uh, system racism in clinical preventive service. So I think that's my last slide. So I won't go through this acknowledgement, and uh, I will stop there. Thank you so much, Professor Lee. That was a fantastic yeah. presentation and very impressive work, both on your own and with the USPTF. Mm -hmm. um, Professor Van Allen, you're up. Wonderful. Am I on the right uh, version? You are. 
Wonderful. So thank you, Dr. Bott, and thank you to the Damon Runyon Foundation for this and many other opportunities you've given me over the years. Uh, my name is Ellie, and I'm a medical oncologist at Dana-Farber, and I'm here to talk to you in the next 10 minutes or so about our patient par partner research program in prostate cancer um, and beyond. Um, so here are my titles, my lab website, and shamelessly my Twitter account if you'd like to follow along and hear me complain about our electronic health record in real time. Um, so, but first, uh, here's some disclosures. So to set up the motivation for this, I thought I'd review some of what's happening currently in the uh, cancer genomics field generally and in prostate cancer genomics in particular. And this sort of is, I thought might be best uh, exhibited by what sounds like a boring power calculation, but I think actually speaks to a larger issue. This was uh, led by Dr. Sophia Kamran, who's a, a former actually trainee in my lab who now is independent at Mass General. And she looked at the um, a very large clinical genomic cohort called Project Genie from the AACR that has many, 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 many thousands and thousands of molecular data sets from cancer patients um, and asked questions about whether there was a simple question, are there enough patients in different groups, uh, racial or ethnic groups as presented by what was available in this data set to even ask questions, to be statistically powered to ask questions about whether there are differences in these groups that might get at some of the underlying either biological questions or questions that pertain to socioeconomic impact. And the summary that she shows in this plot here, if you focus on these two curves, which are really sort of the the, the most, the, the things that are the strongest signal, these sort of the, I guess this is purple and blue, um, and you look for a relatively modest effect size of 0.2, above basically comparing the differences between these groups, you can see pretty clearly that really for none of the different um, non-white groups as represented in this cohort, are we sufficiently powered in what is effectively the largest clinical genomic cancer data set that exists in the world right now. And on top of that, that's really only about one type of category of diversity. We know nothing about their sort of rural versus urban geographic information, and largely the patient voices, the stuff that the patients care about is absent from these kinds of data sets. And so um, this really speaks to a larger challenge that I think is evident in the field and is certainly a problem that in the research that I do, which is that the traditional way we do these kinds of cancer genomics research projects, the way we make these fundamental genome discoveries about our cancer patients is driven in a, a top-down way. We expect patients to come to us at a select set of small, a relatively small set of select institutions across the United States and around the world um, in order to participate in this kind of research. And what that results in is a pretty narrow slice of the, of the patient population uh, who tend to participate in these things that are often skewed and biased in many different ways. Patients seen at my institution at Dana-Farber, places like Memorial Sloan Kettering, Wild, Wild Cornell, um, throughout the, you know, at Stanford, UCSF, throughout the country. You, know, you can see sort of how this might end up being the way it is. And so with that as a backdrop, we started asking a question, a very simple one. What if we took this paradigm of patients being expected to come to us to participate in research. And we flipped the whole thing on its head. And we said, how about instead, we bring the research to the patients wherever they are, regardless of really what their current healthcare access situation is, where they live, um, sort of what state they're in. And we make it very easy and simple for them to participate in this kind of gen genome discovery research across the board. And that really is at the center of what the Metastatic Prostate Cancer Project is. It's an experiment in patient-partnered decentralized cancer genomics research. And so to do this, we actually partnered from day one with a set of, of patient advocates to design and develop uh, sort of a online experience that might actually be um, sort of a welcoming home for them. Here's a screenshot of the of the homepage of this website, mpcproject.org. Um, every single element was designed with, with patients in mind and with patient partners, uh, down to things like the details of the silhouettes of these patients you see on the website. Our initial design actually ended up unwittingly, to we, and we didn't even notice this, or all basically six foot tall, very built athletic men. Um, and we realized that was not actually being representative. And so we needed to work. Actually, you heard from Dr. Yeo earlier about sort of how do you design these kinds of things with patients. And I think this was another illustration where had we not done that, we might have run into issues. Um, and so the way it works is patients go to the website, they click the count me in button. 
um, and they complete a survey and, and so with some consent forms. That gives us permission to do a few things, which is request their archival tumors if they have any available. Um, that also launches a series of things such, that, such as sending them saliva kits and, what, and, if, and blood biopsy kits, basically kits that we send to patients they can bring to their phlebotomist and then actually send us so that we can look for shed DNA in their blood. We then perform molecular sequencing, we collect all the clinical data, we pair it together, and we put this out there in as fast or real time as we humanly can keep up with the data stream. Um, here's an example of what the liquid biopsy kit looks like, and another example of where patient partner research really matters. Our initial box that actually this thing came in said the metastatic prostate cancer project on the box until we started actually workshopping this with patients and one after another, the patients said, you've got to get rid of the word prostate cancer in this box. And I said, why? This is a the metastatic prostate cancer project. And they said, and one person said, doc, I don't want my mailman to know I have prostate cancer. And another man said, doc, I don't want my wife to know I have prostate cancer. And had we not taken some of, some of the really extensive lengths to really hear and listen from the patients and build these things with them, this whole thing might have been sunk from day one. Um, but I'm happy to say we built this with patients in mind, and we launched this project in January of 2018. And as of now, I'm very proud to say that we have over 1,100 men across the United States and in Canada who have signed up and said, count me in and join this project. And to put this into context, I'm also a member of something called the Stand Up to Cancer Prostate Cancer uh, East Coast Dream Team, um, where which represented sort of a more traditional research enterprise, where it took us about twice as long to get a smaller set of patients to participate in the same kind of research initiative. And here we're able to do so in a shorter fashion, getting a much broader swath of, of patients uh, that we hope might actually also be more representative to tackle that main issue that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and so we think we're sort of making some strides in this space. So for example, uh, we are capturing patients predominantly from non-NCI designated cancer centers, and a reasonably large minority of these patients actually come from some combination of physician shortage areas, rural patient, rural geographic uh, uh, areas, or are deemed medically underserved by the federal government, which is good. Um, furthermore, we actually are by virtue of doing this, releasing surveys to these patients who, when they sign up, um, and that helps us check a few things. One, it helps us learn that the patients really understand what they're getting, and actually there's a really remarkably good overlap between what patient reported information is regarding their treatments and what we abstract from the EHR. But more importantly, and I think this was one of the most interesting things I, th I learned from the study, we give a chance for patients to give a voice to the stuff that oftentimes doesn't end up in the electronic health record, and almost certainly, even if it does, never ends up in the research that we give them, like telling us what kind of dietary inter interventions they made, what kind of supplements they're taking, what kind of exercise routines they've gone into. The patients really want to give us this, and it might actually spawn new questions. It also gives us an opportunity to pair some of this patient-reported data with data derived from the electronic health record and the genetics to learn some interesting things, like trying to explore some of the relationships between family history, inherited risk for prostate cancer, and new genes that might actually be contributing to some of these phenomena, or determining which of these genes are relevant in different patient populations. And so in the last minute and a half, knowing that I sort of had trying to keep this at the 10 minute mark, um, I wanna say that we also, definitively solve the, some of the major challenges about representation, not just from geography or patient voices, but also race and ethnicity. And unfortunately, uh, we failed miserably. And I'll just be very transparent. We have this kind of text here. This is an example from our recent publication on this, uh, whereby I'll sort of zoom in on effectively us failing uh, to get uh, patients who are self-identified as non-white. Um, and and we, we sort of make statements like this I think four or five different times throughout the manuscript in the abstract and really everywhere we can just to be very honest and transparent about where we did not succeed. And we're still frankly working hard as a team to try to figure out how we can actually do a better job. Uh, one thing working closely with the entity I'll come to in a moment, we've created a website called uh, blackcancervoices.org uh, that actually gives more voices to underrepresented uh, patient populations to sort of encourage them to talk about the disease for folks who are able and willing that hopefully may help get the word out. And I think this then leads into this project in some sense being a pilot initiative for a much larger effort called Count Me In, uh, 
Um, and I'll sort of give a hat tip to Dr. Nick Wagle, who's the director of Count Me In, uh, along with some of the other folks uh, who are driving some of the other projects, such as Dr. Katie Janeway in a pediatric cancer population, whereby we now have a mechanism for all patients to participate in this type of research, irrespective of where they are and their cancer type and for which we have sort of numerous initiatives trying to engage more directly using technology with diverse patient populations. So with that, I'll end, I believe, right smack uh, on time. Uh, thank you uh, again to the Running Foundation, lots of folks to thank here. And once again, shamelessly, uh, here's my Twitter account for, for me making jokes on the internet. Thanks again. All right, thank you very much, Ellie. Uh, it was a fantastic three presentations. We covered quite a lot of ground. I'd like to invite our participants to put in your questions on the Q&A box. Um, and while we're waiting for those to roll in, I'd love to kick off with a question for each of you. Um, I'd love to hear what you think the top two factors are that contribute to disparities in your research. So I'm happy to start. I um, would say that I think that traditionally research has been very physician centric. And so we think we understand what pa what matters to patients. And I think, you know, you see from Ellie's work that in including the patients in the research is a really important part of breaking down disparities. Um, so that's something that we've tried to do as well. I think uh, participatory research and, and focusing on communities that have typically been underrepresented is really important. Um, the other thing that I'll say is data, um, the data that we study, and you see this from Dr. Lee's work, is that, and, and Ellie's work, is that most of, the, most of the data that we have has traditionally left out a lot of these underrepresented minorities. And there's also been a problem that people are, we have not considered, for example, intersectionality. I'm of mixed race. And when I go to checking off boxes, if I can't check more than one box, I often leave it unanswered. And as researchers, that really becomes a problem because we don't know, we don't know how to link the data we have to the different patient populations. And so those are two things that I think are important, patient inclusion and, and getting good data. Thank you. Well, I add to this. Um... But I think for the cancer etiology research, we a lot of times in the past we focus on individual lifestyle. We talk about smoke and, um, and exercise, and really forget about the larger environment, contextual factors in our community, society. Those really drives a lot of active disparity we're talking about. I think the the I work is really trying to integrate the neighborhood or community disadvantage in that into our explicit modeling how they impact the. Uh, epigenome genomes, that's what we're trying to get at. In that sense, the multi-level modeling process, you have the biology, how that impact with your individual lifestyle as well as the social styles. So that's what we're trying to get at. I think that's the part that has been, it's hard to, it's hard to study. And is, for example, systemic uh, you know, racism is hard to study, but it's a big factor. Absolutely. So I agree with all the statements made uh, already. I think the only things I would add, you know, I, I'm struck by, a, I remember having a conversation with a prostate cancer patient advocate um, who, you know, who basically told me after we started seeing that we were not getting the kind of uh, diversity we were hoping for our project, he said, you know, well, when are you coming with me to Western Mass to meet with my support group? And I said, well, uh, I'm checking my calendar. I'll get in the car. I'll go sometime soon. And he said, Great, because I can promise you nobody's going to sign up for any of this until you come to us. <laughs> and I think, and that's the right point. Uh, you know, the, the the sort of the medical research industrial complex, or want to call it, really is expecting everyone to come to us for these kinds of things. And I think we need to very aggressively um, do the reverse of that uh, as a community and as a field. Um, and that's going to take a long time, and you know, and require tons of investment. Um, you know community building and trust trust building to actually enable. Uh, but I think that's that's the only way we'll actually truly overcome a lot of these issues in the long run. Um, and I think that's something we're, we're still learning in real time. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, you've touched on a lot of important points. I want to pick up on this point of community-based research and participatory research. Um, you know, there's a long spec, there's a big spectrum of community-based research going all the way from having field workers who are based in communities, live in communities, part of communities, 
um, engaging in and helping to co-lead research on particular topics um, to, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, a little bit more of a maybe if we build this, they will come type of approach where anybody can opt in. I think we saw a very nice example of this in Dr. Van Allen's presentation of a place where anybody can can choose to be counted should they so choose. Um, but we saw some of the advantages and disadvantages of those approaches. Um, so I'd love to hear from Heather a little bit about you know, what participatory research means. I think it's probably unfamiliar to many of us. Um, so what does it mean to you? And then I'd love to ask a question to Dr. Van Allen. You know, in round two of your web-based outreach, what do you think are gonna be the most impactful changes that you're making to increase diversity? So um, as you mentioned, uh, there are multiple, actually it's evolved really over the last decade and a half, um, the concept of community-based participatory research. Um, it, there was a, a strong movement in the early 2000s to really, you know, as Dr. Van Allen has done, go to communities, find out, I mean, start from the very basic roots. One of my very first projects, um, I did a Robert Johnson Clinical Scholarship, and in the early 2000s, we were going to the community door to door to ask them what health problems were important to them. And while that's a really good way to do things, it also is a relatively involved and pretty slow process. Um, and so really trying to find ways that the community and your research overlap, I think is an important way to do it. Um, I, I, I do think con in integrating pa some patient component in all my research has been really important for me, whether that's working with a patient advocate during my design of my project, or whether or not that's taking my results and feeding them back to the community to say, does this mean something to you? Um, but that's really, I mean, the, the focus of community-based participatory research is just that from the start to the finish involving individuals who are who you're studying in your work. And that can be whatever community you're a part of. Um, it's harder in some communities than others where you, you know, a researcher may not may not fit in and the language may be different, but I think. The more you can include patients, the more meaningful the work will be uh, towards to them. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I'm not sure I have. Uh, uh, that was a fantastic answer. I, I wish I would have said something that smart. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add. I'm trying to think. You know, um, one thing that I, I, it's hard to put a value. I mean, you kind of need all of these things together. I think, and truthfully, I don't think you know both the sort of technology all comers approach. Also, the sort of you know um, boots on the ground, you know, small communities approach. I think are both effective and and the in, in sort of the modern era, hard to sort of not try to do both at the same time. Um, the only other thing that I, I think we've tried to challenge ourselves on um, internally, even in my own group, like is really um, trying to be very transparent and honest with what we do and know and don't know, and when we don't have representation. I think historically, so some of the, for instance, like the germline genetics work we've done in the past and, and much of the field is like you basically, we do ancestry matching. You basically realize every time we'd only have enough data for, you know, European descent, white patients, and then the other stuff doesn't even get reported. And so at least reporting this, even when we don't even have enough is important and sort of making a, a principled stand to do that, even if it's at the expense of maybe not looking as good because it's not what we're hoping for. And then likewise, you know, um, building in some of these aspects to really every research project we start with um, going, you know, from day one, instead of waiting until day, you know, 500 uh, to actually come back to this part of the question, I think is uh, all, it's all relevant, it's all at play. Um, and ho hopefully we'll be able to sus develop sustainable ways of doing this with, you know, funding from NIH and elsewhere. Absolutely. I think, you know, transparency along the spectrum of research um, engagement to reporting is incredibly important. I have a question from the audience from Tracy. Um, can you please speak more to your experiences around finding the right level of language, meaning words used to meet the scientific need and respect and connect with patients and their families in materials that are patient facing? I mean, I think that Ellie answered it earlier. It's really important to um, it's really important to connect with the patients and 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 ask them if they understand and what they understand. Yeah, I think we um we uh, 
found ourselves, uh, again, almost making many catastrophic mistakes. So in our survey, we showed some questions like words that we were taking for granted about metastasis and whatnot. And the patient advocates were like godsend and basically telling us like, hey, you dummies, you know, like this is, <laughs> people aren't going to understand a word of what you say. And you really have to be very careful and, and spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, and one last thing on that point, actually, is even, you know, I think we, Tend to think about this, and even even here there are biases where it's effectively all in English. And um, you know, thinking about how we make these these um, technologies multilingual from day one, I think is something another another aspect that could otherwise result in um, you know gatekeeping and and additional biases down the road. There are specialists also. There are language specialists that we also often work uh, with at most institutions that will help you get the reading level correct. Um, but then there are very different cultural things that you need to understand from the exact communities that you're serving. And so that's where your patient advocates and your community members can help you. Absolutely. Fantastic. Very helpful. Um, my next question, you, what kind of a role does a funding agency like Damon Runyon play in trying to make research be more inclusive, which is, I think, what we all want, but we appreciate how hard it is to actually achieve that. Each of you spoke about that. So I'd, I'd just love to hear how you think Damon Runyon actually can play a role in moving this ball forward. And maybe I'll ask Lee to start. Okay. Um, well, that's that's a good question. So I, I'll share, share my, my experience. When I started about 20 years ago, I was funded as uh, in 2000, 2001, 2006. And I'm a family physician. I do uh, do risk assessment and epidemiology. When I applied for this, I was interested. So an outcome calls that you're selected, but you're a family doc. Why are you you're in cancer research? So I think that that shows diversity of the research working for us. I'll share with you that the NCI now has for each cancer cancer center or cancer now has a new leadership position called the director DI. So that's basic increased diversity of the research uh, we uh, investigate in terms of representing different populations. Uh, I, you know, I'm so glad to see Heather's work in the space. And uh, 20 years, I will never see that your, your work will be funded by Damien Ryan. So that's one example I think is moving a long way. So I think the investigator pool is diversity for investigators as well as question answers has to represent our general population. I think that's what I would see. Thank you. Heather and then Ellie, and then uh, we'll, we'll be wrapping up. Oh, Heather, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Um, so I, I just think, you know, as we, as we look at how, I mean, David Ryan has helped in a number of ways. The first thing I will say is by supporting diverse scientists. Um, as you know, that they've, they've supported uh, many women and minorities um, to be funded, um, which is uh, unusual and, and has been a struggle for the NIH to, to actually continue to fund diverse scientists. Um, and then I think that they are also funding diverse research focused on um, in decreasing disparities. So I, I, it's, it's one of the reasons that I've been proud to be funded through the Damon Runyon Foundation. Yep, I think I would just add, I mean, echo that, I mean, certainly Damon Runyon Foundation is at the forefront of this. So thank you all for, for enabling all these kinds of research and being so forward thinking. Um, there, there are, depending on the, the research mechanism, you know, ensuring that there is adequate representation in cohorts and there's an expectation of that, even in their RFA, the, the request, request for applications, I think would be, would go a big way. I mean, you know, they'll and force investigators to adapt to what frankly should be expected at this point in terms of making those kinds of statements. Could be another thought, but all, all of it's fantastic. Thank you. I know we could all talk for so much longer. I have so many questions for you. I know there were some questions we weren't able to get to, but I wanna thank all of our panelists um, for their fantastic presentations, their groundbreaking work, and um, the important, important efforts that they're making to try and improve outcomes for all people. I'm gonna hand it back over to Young for the last words. Thank you all so much. This was such a fascinating and thought provoking discussion and conversation. And as Ami said, I would love to stay on with you for much longer. Um, I think one of the takeaways um, from this these presentations and the conversation is that I think we can all challenge ourselves um, as individuals and as organizations and through our work um, 
to do better and continue to move toward inclusivity and diversity in all areas. And so we are so grateful for all of the important work that each of you is doing. And thank you again for joining us to share um, all of your insights today. Um, and thank you again to the audience for joining us. Please uh, watch your email for a link to complete a post webinar survey and provide feedback and suggestions to our team for future events. Thank you so much for joining us again, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. Thank you.